The text this morning is from James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. These are the words of God. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If many man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, so the tongue among our members, so is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig trees, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with, with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Father, we pray that your spirit would be in our midst this morning. We pray that as you speak to each heart, that each of us would feel the sweet compulsion of your spirit and would look you straight in the eye as you address us through your word. We pray earnestly that the breath of your spirit would blow the miasma of all our shifts and evasions clean away. We ask for this in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. This chapter, this passage, contains the phrase that I've taken as the title of the entire series of messages from the book of James, and that phrase is the wisdom from above. This book is all about the wisdom from above. But this wisdom from above is not an abstract set of rules. It is not an abstract set of principles. Never forget that our wisdom from above has a name, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom from above. Jesus is God's wisdom given to us so that we may know what it looks like walking, talking, teaching, breathing, rebuking. This is what wisdom from above looks like. As we go through the, the text, James tells us here that not many people should want to be teachers. Not many people should want to be teachers, and then he goes on and gives the reason. But he says, don't, don't try to be a teacher. Try not to be a teacher. If, um, if you try hard to not be a teacher and God makes you a teacher anyway, all right. As people, uh, I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones said, you ought not to be a minister unless you cannot do anything else, all right. You, you, try, you try and you try and you try, but God heads you off and you, you find yourself um, happy. You're, you're under compulsion. People who go into, into teaching the Word of God are in a perilous spot. This is because teachers, James says, come under stricter judgment. We all stumble, everybody here stumbles in many ways, including verbal stumbles. We say things that came out wrong. We say things we didn't mean. Or worse, we say things we did mean and wish now that we didn't, um, hadn't meant them. We all stumble in many ways, including in our words, and teachers do that up in front of everybody. So when everyone sins with the tongue, everyone stumbles with the tongue, teachers do it in a more public way. If a man controls his tongue, then that means he is able to control himself entirely. Verbal self-control is the king of all self-control. Verbal self-control is the king, the ruler of all self-control. If a man controls his tongue, he can control the rest of himself. A bit in a horse's mouth is small, but it directs the whole animal, verse 3. 
a ship of great size and in a great storm is still directed by a small helm. Verse 4. The tongue is small, but it's influential in the same way. Like the bit in the horse's mouth, like the helm on a ship, the tongue is small, but enormously influential. The tongue steers. The tongue directs. The tongue is a fire, James says, and he, uh, particularly in the original, he seems to be overdoing it. He says, the tongue is a fire, and he says, it is a cosmos of iniquity, a world of iniquity, and the word, Greek word is cosmos. He, the, the tongue is a fire, it is a cosmos of iniquity, and it got the fire that it has because hell set it on fire. It defiles the whole body, and it sets the entire wheel of life. The word there is wheel. The, it sets the entire course of life. It sets the entire wheel of life, the wheel of nature, on fire. It's set on fire by the tongue, and the tongue is set on fire by hell. Every kind of beast has been tamed by man, verse 7, but the tongue, not so much. Every kind of beast has been trained, tamed by man, but the tongue, not so much. I recall one time at SeaWorld watching a killer whale come up out of the water with a lady standing on his nose. I, I would say that's pretty impressive. Every beast has been tamed by man, and wouldn't it be nice if we could tame the tongue as easily as that? The tongue is schizophrenic, James says, blessing God and cursing the image of God. Blessing God and then turning around and seeing God's image and cursing that. How, what sense does that make? Bless God, curse the image of God. That's not fitting. Does a fountain do that? Verse 11. Does a fig tree bear contrary to its nature? Does a vine bear contrary to its nature? Verse 12. Neither does a fountain, neither does the human heart. The human heart bears according to its nature. Just like a fountain, just like a fig tree, just like a thorn bush, the human heart bears according to its nature, and it bears fruit according to its nature. And the principal fruit that we bear is verbal. It's what we say. It's how we talk. The tongue is a helm. So who is the helmsman? Right, if the tongue is a helm, who is the helmsman? If we want to know who the wise man is, we look for a good way of life and meekness of wisdom, verse 13. But if envy and strife are residing in your heart, then stop vaunting in your glory and stop lying against the truth, James says. This wisdom, for James acknowledges that some call it wisdom, does not come down from above. There's a wisdom from above and there's a wisdom from below. The wisdom from below is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Devilish means it accuses, right? Devilish means it accuses. Earthly means it's earthbound. Sensual means it's geared very, very closely attuned to what brings pleasure to the person, the, the individual concerned. And devilish means uh, prone to accusation, prone to accuse others, verse 15. Where this heart is, there confusion, disorder, and every vile practice follow. Verse 16, the wisdom that does come from above and which Jesus is the perfect embodiment of is first, pure, second, peaceable, third, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and honest. That is wisdom from above contrasted with wisdom from below, which is earthly, sensual, and devilish, and which can disrupt everything and which is itself set on fire by hell. Those who make peace are sowing peace, and the harvest is righteousness. Those who make peace are sowing peace, and the harvest is righteousness. Verse 18. Now, before we get uh, into this passage in detail, looking at some of the, some of the particular things in it in more, in, in more detail than just this overview, I want us to be, I want to remind you that all of us are aware of how the New Testament is laid out. All of us are aware of the book of James, and all of us are aware of the book of James has a chapter on the tongue. And whenever a minister announces he's going to preach on the tongue or he's going to preach through James, uh, he's going to preach through James. That means he's going to preach through James 3. Whatever shall we do? <laughs> do I have any vacation time? Um, can I go away? All God's people said, uh-oh, right? So all God's people, because 
look at all these tongues, all this, after, after the service, there'll be all this chatter, happy noise of chatter, there's, there's conversations, and, and where, where there's a multitude of words, it says in Proverbs, sin is not absent. Where there's a multitude of words, sin is not absent. So we are, are, we, are we think, very attuned to this problem. But we often hide our real problems under a veil of hypersensitivity about the wrong things. We sometimes hide the real problem we have with our verbal expressions under a veil of hypersensitivity about all the wrong things. This passage is not at all describing a couple of church ladies chatting about who might get engaged next. All right, that's not what it's talking about. Well, in the first place, could be anybody who's going to get engaged next. You never, in this place, it's happened all the time. And we'll announce it for you, and so you don't need to worry about it. The passage is not talking about those sorts of conversations. Why do, we, why do we always assume that James chapter 3 is about gossip? It doesn't mention gossip. It's not talking about gossip. And what we call gossip oftentimes isn't even gossip biblically defined. Just having a pleasant conversation about the good news that so-and-so got a job or so-and-so is getting married or they're expecting. A lot of times people say, oh, we need to be careful. We, we, can't, we have to be careful. We better not issue prayer requests too lightly because the prayer request might be gossip. We're, we're hyper about gossip. There is such a thing as ungodly gossip. There is such a thing as running people down on the way home from church. There is such a thing as that kind of gossip. But James is not talking about that in this passage. Gossip isn't even mentioned. This is all about ambition, power struggles, envy, turf, bite, uh, t turf fighting, strife, infighting, cursing, throwing elbows, and so on. And before we say something like, oh, well, that's a relief then, we need to do a little spiritual inventory because James seems to think that this problem is far more common than we tend to think. And, and he, is, he is speaking to his brethren. How does the chapter start? My brethren don't have tongues set on fire by hell, brothers. All right, so he's talking to Christian believers. He's talking to a Christian church. He's saying, don't allow hell to set your tongue on fire and then burn the whole place down. So this is talking about big stuff. It's not talking about idle chatter. Jesus says, of course, that we will be brought, um, that, that we're going to be held accountable for every idle word that we utter. But James is not talking about the idle words that we utter. James is talking about the important words that we utter. He's talking about the things that we thought about a long time. He's talking about the times when we think we're doing right and we're not doing right at all. Now, what, consider the context here. He says that the tongue is fire. The, t the tongue is a spark of fire capable of burning the whole place down. And he began by saying not many should be teachers. Teachers operate in a stand of trees. Their calling puts them in the forest. Their calling puts them in a forest, and their job calling, their vocation is to preach and teach. It's to use words. So their calling puts them in a forest, puts them in a stand of trees, puts trees all around them, and then they, the word says, and now talk for a living, write for a living, teach, use words which means that if you do it wrong, if you, if, you, if you neglect what James is talking about here, your tongue, your spark, is capable of burning down all of western Montana. Right? The more influential you are, the, big, the bigger the ministry is, the bigger the church is, the bigger the setting is, the more damage you can do with an unguarded tongue. That's why not many should be teachers. That's why you ought to think twice, think three times. Think, you know, many people say, oh, you know, teaching, I think I'm going to, you know, teaching is an indoor job, no heavy lifting, you know. Well... True teachers, true teachers know what a lot of sacrifice it is, what it actually is, and they know how much responsibility it is, and they know that they're going to be judged more strictly, but they're going to be judged more strictly because they've got people in front of them. People's lives depend on how they talk. So this means that if the unregulated fire of their words gets loose, the result is a forest fire. 
Now, James is not comparing, he's not simply comparing two kinds of people, you know, good people and bad people. He's comparing two kinds of people, each, cl- each kind of person claiming to be the rightful possessor of something called wisdom. The question James is posing here is who is right? Who is the wise man? Who is the wise man really? When a dispute breaks out, whenever a dispute breaks out between secularists or between a Christian and a secularist or between Christians, whenever a dispute breaks out, nobody stops and says, wait, wait, before we get into this, who, who's going to be the wise man and who's going to be the fool? Let's do rock, paper, scissors for who, who's going to be what? You be the wise man this time, I'll be the fool. No, everybody in every dispute thinks that they are the wise man. Everyone in every dispute thinks that they've got it right. Everybody. Nobody walks through life thinking they're wrong. Because if they did, they would think that was right. You can't think I'm wrong. You can, you, it, you, the way God has made us, the way we are constituted, it is impossible for us to think that right now the thought I'm thinking, the thought I'm believing, the thing I'm articulating is erroneous. Now, if you're doing that self-consciously, you're lying for another purpose. But if you are convinced of what you're saying, that's another way of saying, that's the same way of saying that you're convinced of what you're saying. So in a dispute, everybody thinks he's wise. So James says, how do we sort this out? Who is the wise man? You look at the last verse in the chapter, you you, you can tell from the harvest. You, You tell from the fruit at the end of the process. This is how we can tell. But everybody in the midst of the fracas, everybody in the middle of it, thinks that they are the wise man. So who is the wise man? The the answer is that real wisdom, verse 13, real wisdom is meek. Now remember earlier in James, he says that we are to receive with meekness the word which can save our souls. The word of God, the gospel, is given to us. God speaks to us. We receive his word with meekness. When we receive his word with meekness, it begins to do the work of salvation in us, and we begin to display that same characteristic. We speak with meekness. We receive with meekness. We speak with meekness. There's a kind of wisdom that gets called wisdom, both by the person who's articulating it and and the cheering squad around the person who's articulating it. There's the kind of wisdom that isn't true wisdom that wants to glory in envy and strife. It wants to lie against the truth and still call it wisdom. Wants to call it good. Wants to stand up in front of the television cameras and stand in front of microphones and say, this is good. This is the way we ought to go. Decent Americans want to do this. Every good-hearted person wants to do this. This is wisdom. But God's word says that's folly. Those who want to set themselves up against God do not set themselves up against God by saying, hello, I'm here from the devil and I've come to lead you astray. That's not how the pitch goes. The pitch goes, if you have a heart, if you have a conscience, if you really want to do what's right for your people, you will vote for so-and-so, or you will approve of thus and such. You will do these things, and it's all decked out in wisdom. It's decked out in wisdom that's earthly, sensual, and diabolical. But it's presented as wisdom, and a lot of people are persuaded that it, in fact, is that kind of wisdom. James calls it wisdom also, after a fashion, but put the the scare quotes around it. James calls it wisdom also, but he says that it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. And the person who's going to do the earthly, sensual, and devilish wisdom is often like a squid spraying ink. He gets away with what he does because he gets away with it in the chaos. Because when everything gets disordered and confused enough, nobody can tell after three weeks of this who started it. Everybody forgets. Everything's confused. What does he, what does he say when you have uh, this kind of uh, envying and strife? Verse 16, where, it, where there's envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Everything goes wrong. Everything falls apart. And everybody's confused. Why are they confused? Well, because there's all, you're, when, when you're in the middle of an accused fest, when people are pointing fingers at one another, you're, you're not thinking about in a dispassionate way. You're not climbing up to the balcony overseeing this whole thing and looking down on it as though you were a non-participant. 
you're, you, you have to watch out that you don't accuse. You have to watch out, is, is, somebody going to, is someone going to accuse you? Are, you going, are, they, are they gonna come after you? Well, you're in the middle of this food fight and it's awfully hard. If you're, if you're 45 minutes into a cafeteria food fight, not, this is a thought experiment, I'm not saying you ever have been, but if you're in 45 minutes into a cafeteria food fight, you might have lost all track of who started it or what, what the point was or how did this begin? How did this even begin? Have you ever been in a fuss or a quarrel with someone in your family and, uh, and then half an hour into it, you both burst out laughing because what's this about? <laughs> Do you know? No, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know? No, I don't know either. Let's stop it. Well, I think a lot of people, that, that is where the people involved have some sort of sense of God's way outside of that. But there are people who live their entire life that way. They're always in the middle of it. They're always in the thick of it. They always think they're right. They always think they're wise. Real wisdom, the kind of wisdom that comes down from above, the kind of wisdom that comes down like Jesus, is peace-seeking, it's gentle, it's full of mercy, and it's full of sweet reasonableness. I love that phrase in the, in the KJV where it says it's easily entreated, easy to entreat. Wisdom from above is easy to talk to. Wisdom from above is approachable. You can come to them and come to a person who has that kind of wisdom, and they are, they're willing to listen to you. They're easy to entreat. Now, if, they, if you come to a person who has the wisdom from above and you entreat them, well, hey, let's go sin, or let's go break seven out of the Ten Commandments, or let's go do this. They're not going to be easily entreated that way, but they're easily in, in, the, dis, in the dispute, in the dispute between Yodia and Syntyche in Philippians, we don't know who was right or wrong in that dispute. But whoever had the wisdom from above, the other person could have gone to them, and they would have been easily entreated. So it's marked not by the, not by the claim to be easily entreated, but by being easily entreated. Real wisdom does not conjugate the verb this way. I am firm, you are stubborn, he is pig-headed. If you, the further away you get from yourself, it, if, if stubbornness is farther and farther away from you, I'm easily entreated, he is a little bit more difficult, and, the, and across town, it, they're just beyond hope. No, in the final analysis, if you want to know what's going on, always, if you want to know what was planted, Always look at the harvest. Always look at the fruit. Always fruit. Remember the perfections of Jesus. And marvel at this crowning perfection. I, uh, the Lord's virtues are described in many different ways throughout Scripture. But I, th I think this must be one of the great unmentioned crowning perfections of the Lord Jesus. The fact that he was not totally exasperated all the time in every conversation he ever had with anybody. Just picture the perfect son of God becoming a man and coming down and living in our midst and what he had to listen to. <laughs> I just... And then after three years, and then he gets 12 aside, 12 aside, and he travels with them and teaches them intensely uh, for three years. And he's going to Jerusalem at the end of his ministry. He's going, and, and on the road behind him, a fight breaks out over who's going to be the greatest. Can you, can you imagine a perfect human being living for 10 minutes in our midst and not throwing things all the time? <laughs> But he didn't. Not only did he not do that, not only did he not lose patience with what had to have been total provocation, one provocation after another, he wasn't totally exasperated all the time. Look at how he lived. He emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not only did he, not only did he spend time with us, he poured out his life for us. He didn't just come down to put up with idiots. He came down to die for idiots. He put up with us. That's amazing. But then he goes to the cross. And he allows people to, uh, dressed up priests and Pharisees, to come to the foot of the cross and taunt him. He said, his words, his words are supposed to be so perfect. He said he was going to, he said, let him come down and save himself. Neener, neener, neener. You know, the, the best and the brightest, the most highly trained of our, that our race had to produce. 
the people who were steeped in the scriptures, basically gather at the crucifixion of the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, and do the equivalent of a playground neener neener. And Jesus does nothing. He receives it. He receives it. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, it says in Hebrews. Not only did he spend his time with us, he spent his life for us, and in, his, in the person of his spirit, he's spending time with us now. It's not like he just had to put up with those conversations for 30 years. He's been putting up with those conversations for 2,000 years. He's in our presence. He's in our midst. Envy and strife do not set their face to go to Jerusalem to be crucified by the chief priests and scribes. They don't see any future for the self in that. Self-centered glory does not set a child in the midst of the disciples who are jockeying for position and tell them that they must be like that little child. That's not what self-importance does. Self-centered glory rather tries to keep the children away. Self-centered glory does not say, bring the children to me so that I may bless them. Devilish ambition does not teach us to take the lowest seat so that God may be the one who promotes us. Always want to be the one whom God has promoted, not the one who shoved his way to the head of the line. Devilish ambition cannot help itself. Devilish ambition must seek its own glory. Devilish ambition must hang tight. But Jesus let go of all of it. He let go of heaven. He let go of every glory imaginable, and he became one of us. And it's like, it's, it's like you trying to imagine becoming an earwig or going down to being born into an ant farm and... And not only being born into an ant farm, but being the only perfect ant who ever lived, and then to be treated by all the other ants as a criminal and an outcast. That's what Jesus did. He just let it all go. He emptied himself, took the form of a servant, and he came down to give it all away. That's the wisdom from above. Now, when our conversation reflects that kind of wisdom, you're not, it's not grabby. It's not self-seeking. It's not throwing elbows. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Unless you assume that this meekness that I'm talking about means becoming a doormat in the face of true evil, remember that this meekness from God cleansed the temple with a whip, rebuked the Pharisees with high satire, Matthew chapter 23, and was enough of a firebrand that the authorities had him crucified as a public menace. Meekness does not equal weakness. Meekness is not the same thing as being some sort of pencil neck Casper milk toast. That's not meekness. Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth, it says in the Old Testament, and he's the one who left the superpower of the day, Egypt, a smoldering ruin, and, and led the Israelites out into the wilderness and managed, managed and led and, and worked with them. Uh, Moses was a valuable servant in the household of God, as it says in the book of Hebrews. And he was a meek man. Jesus was a meek man. But he was a strong man precisely because of that meekness. It's meekness toward God, not weakness toward man. It's meekness toward God. And if you're meek toward God, then you're going to be reflecting the kind of wisdom that he gives. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, it says that we, we should exhort one another daily, lest any of us be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, I said earlier that James thought that this was a more common problem among Christians than we tend to think. We say, oh, yeah, yeah, I bet we gossip too much, and that's probably a common problem, Let, and, and let's move on to study something else. But that, I, I don't think it is that big a problem. I do think ambition and self-serving and quarrels and quarrels and tensions in families, quarrels and tensions between husbands and wives, quarrels and tensions between coworkers, quarrels and tensions between people who profess the name of Christ are common. James says they're common. And the author of Hebrews tells us to exhort one another how often? Daily. Exhort one another every day, lest anybody be hardened 
by the deceitfulness of sin. Christians get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and to guard against that, they've got to do something every day. It's not something where you can say, oh, I, you know, when I was first converted 27 years ago, I learned a few valuable lessons, and I just made a mental note of them, and now I've been living normally ever since. That's not how it works. Lest any of you be hardened through uh, sin's deceitfulness, what, how does sin deceive you? Sin deceives you by making you think you're wise in one sense when you're not being wise in that sense at all. You are being wise in the other sense. When you're being deceived, you think you're easily entreated. You think you're peace-loving. You think you're pure. You think you're doing that, but it's actually earthly, sensual, and devilish. The deceitfulness of sin will totally skew your understanding of how God sees you, and it will totally skew your understanding of how your neighbor sees you. The, the deceitfulness of sin will withhold critical feedback information from you. You need to know. What would happen to you if you, if, if you all of a sudden lost all your nerve endings? You couldn't feel anything. Well, you might, you, might, you might think, well, I, this would be great. I'll never experience pain. Well, you won't experience pain, but you will experience damage. You won't experience pain, but you will experience damage. And that's because you'll run into things, bump into things, cut yourself and not know. Um, and after a while, you're going to start just falling apart because you're damaged even though you're not feeling it. When you're hardened by sin to, sin's deceitfulness, that's what it's like. You're, you're hardening yourself to the nerve endings. When someone, when someone comes and tells you something that's uncomfortable, when someone tells you something, whether it's true or not, you, our reaction sometimes tells us that, you know, uh, I'm going to react whether or not it's true because I don't care if it's true. I just care whether or not it's going to adversely uh, uh, affect me. If you're doing that, you're deadening your nerve endings. That's, you're hardening yourself, and that means you will feel no pain, you will not experience the pain, but you do experience the damage. Because God wants you to understand yourself the way he understands you. He wants you to think uh, his thoughts after him with regard to your story. He wants you to see your story, your relationships, your marriage, your relationship to your kids, your relationship to your little kids, your relationship to your grown kids, your relationship to your neighbor on this side and your neighbor on that side and your neighbor across the street from you. He wants you to see yourself accurately. He wants you to see yourself the way it is. And the only way you can see yourself that way is if the wisdom from above, if Jesus comes down and tells you the way it is. This is what you're doing. This is how you talk to your wife, and that's not fruitful. This is how you snap at your kids, and this is why it's not fruitful. The wisdom from above can give you a lot of information if you're willing to hear it. But if you're not exhorted every day, if you're being hardened by sin's deceitfulness, it's not happening. One other thing that I'd maybe conclude with. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century minister, uh, Reformed Baptist minister in London, once said that whenever God starts to work, whenever God starts to move, it always looks to us like undoing rather than doing. Whenever God starts to move, it always looks like to us he's wrecking things. He's messing things up. It always looks to us like undoing rather than doing, and that's why we resist it. We resist it because we, we prefer the comfort of the situation we have. We don't want to move. We don't want to pack everything in boxes. We don't want to do it a different way. We, do, we like what we've got. And so when God says, I'm going to I'm going to do a marvelous thing. We've been praying for 20 years plus in this congregation. We've been praying regularly for reformation and revival. But reformation and revival never, ever happen without bursting the wineskins and without sticky wine all over the floor. That's what we're praying for. When we ask for God to do something, we're asking for him to come down and undo all the things that we built that sort of resist him or that block. And, and then when he starts to do it, we get defensive. If God wants to move in your family, he's going to have to undo some things. If God's going to move in your marriage, he's going to undo some things. If God is going to, un if God is going to move and do some wonderful things in your place of business, between your coworkers, in fractured relationships, in extended families, when God starts to do, it will seem to you 
like he's undoing. And you say, Lord, not that, not that. In your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, in your ministries, whatever it is, God does, God speaks in accordance with this wisdom from above. And he reveals to us the extent to which we've not been speaking with the wisdom from above. Our Father in God, we thank you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be active in our hearts and that he would move in his sovereignty and power in such a way as to untie every knot here. This would be nothing for you to do, but it would be a great thing for us. As part of this desire, we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, the charge is this. One of the toughest duties of a church member or duties of a parishioner, um, and this is true every Lord's Day, and, uh, but particularly for a message like the one you just heard, one of your toughest duties is before God, you need to have heard a better message than the one that was preached. That's your duty. Take it to heart better than it was preached. Take it home. Make it better than it was preached. The blessings of God, God the Father Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you always. Amen.